Hi, it's Robin. I've got here an Apple Lisa, specifically an Apple Lisa 2. This is more bits than I usually deal with, but I had the opportunity to borrow this machine. And because it's historically significant and kind of cool, I thought I'd take a look at it and hopefully you'll be interested too. So whether this was originally sold as a Lisa 2 or a Macintosh XL, I'm not entirely sure. It's had some modifications made to it. You can definitely tell it's not an original Lisa. The original Lisa has two large five and a quarter inch disk drives here, while the Lisa 2 shipped with a single three and a half inch disk and an internal hard drive. The Macintosh XL looks identical, but has a few modifications so that it can also boot up as a Macintosh. So today we're going to take a bit of a look inside the machine at some of the interesting features, and then we'll see if we can get to boot up and take a look at the Lisa operating system and some of the built-in applications. I'm interested in see if I can program this, but that will have to wait for another episode, if at all. I don't have any of the development software for it, and it seems like it's a bit of a job to get that installed on here. First we'll take a tour around the machine. Here's the external keyboard. It's a fairly normal configuration, although strangely it has both a return key here and an enter key, and over here another enter key on the number pad. Now this is odd, this is the odd one. It has two option keys and the Apple key. Strangely, no separate cursor keys. There are some cursor keys embedded up here. The small Apple logo down here in the corner. And it has a bit of styling with this kind of tiered look. Pretty hefty and thick. And down here's where the cable plugs in. The quarter inch plug. Curious about the protocol that keyboard would use. Plugs in here and it's right below the power button. And the keyboard also has this these recessed areas on the left and the right, which fit over the legs here. So that keyboard can be tucked away under here. Here on the back of the machine, got a regular power connector, 120 volts AC, 60 hertz, standard power socket. This is a push button that says interrupt. These two connectors are serial A and serial B, both 25 pin connectors. This nine pin is labeled mouse. And here's a better look at the Apple mouse. Typical ball mouse, actually reminds me a bit of the Amiga mouse in design. Of course, this was first, so. There's the nine pin connector. Well, eight pins actually. And I think the idea was that you're supposed to be able to, supposed to have to squeeze that to remove it. And the last two things are a video out. I was hopeful I could do video capture off of it from that but it's a non-standard signal. It's a 60 hertz signal, but it has a 22.9 kilohertz horizontal rate, while a regular signal is about 15.7 kilohertz. So this is about 45% higher than normal. So anyway, now my video capture devices would work with it. And here's a reset button. And there are three card slots here. There's no cards installed, so those are just the covers. And here's controls for the built-in monitor and the rainbow Apple logo. There are two clips on the front, just under here. I pulled one out. Then the whole front panel just comes off that easy. What those clips look like. So it exposes the CRT. And this little piece here goes into a switch here that will immediately turn off the computer if the cover is removed, presumably to prevent danger to the user from the CRT. So the Lisa can't be run without the front cover on, I guess unless you modify it, but I'm not about to do any paperclip tricks with that. And that opens up this right area where we can get access to the floppy drive, and the hard drive has been removed and replaced with a fairly modern device called an X Profile, which is a hard drive emulator or converter to IDE. So it can run off of compact flash disks 
or actual IDE hard drives. Made in Canada, eh? By Sigma 7 Systems. This is a surprisingly complicated device. It does not just allow you to pop a hard drive image onto Compact Flash and run off of that. I barely understand how it works, but it has the single digit LED and these two dials where you can tell it what mode you want to run in and what the target is for various operations. And it seems to me that all preparation is done here on the device itself. It's a smart device. Perhaps when it was made, this made the most sense. Now, this seems like <laughs> it seems really kind of over engineered and tedious to use now. So, I think that was made around 2005. Anyway, I'm not knocking it. It works. It's about a $370 device. You can still buy them new now. But if somebody came up with something that would be easier to do the preparation work and the backups just by popping the card into a modern computer, to me that would be a much nicer solution nowadays. Again, all respect to, to whoever made this. It seems very well built. Actually, you can just loosen this one screw down here. And this whole section comes out here. So it's surprising how much you can do on this machine with no tools at all. Apple really has gone back and forth over the years between amazingly accessible user-friendly designs and the absolute worst in preventing any kind of repair or upgrading. So put that back in. There's just this upper lip here that slips right up in and then you just click it on at the bottom. And access on the back panel is also easy. There's just these two screws it could just be operated by hand. It's a little odd that they stick out so far, but actually it does make it easy to use by hand. And I think if this is leaned on its back panel, these would actually protect these monitor controls from any damage or from getting jammed in there. So I guess it's smart. And then this just hinges down and lifts right off. And again, the modular design applies. Single thumb screw down here. And the whole power unit comes out. So it has a edge connector in here. That fits in back there. Okay, look inside there. Nice cage on it there. There's the other end. And then this whole chassis actually just pulls right out. Just like this. You are tearing me apart, Lisa! End of the CRT sticks out here. There's the two edge connectors that the main motherboard here plugs into. So there's the I.O. ports that we already looked at. And there's the three card slots. This is really cool here. You can see that that plug into the main motherboard are these four very large cards, well, especially these two, labeled IO, CPU, and M for memory. I'm going to leave the CPU and IO cards in, but we can pull the RAM cards and they have these levers at either side. Just lift them up here. And it just lifts. Oops that in and it lifts right out and the second one just like that and then you just gotta feed this guy back so there's the memory card this is apparently 512k nine chips in each bank it has a parity bit for each one you hear Upper byte and lower byte memory board. Okay, and that lets us look easily at the CPU board here. This giant one is the 68000, just the same that's used on the early Macintoshes, the Amigas, the Atari ST. Internally, it's a 32 bit chip, but it's got a 16 bit data bus. That's why I kind of consider it a 16 32 bit hybrid chip. The first time I opened up my Amiga 500, 
and got a look at the processor. I was shocked by how huge it was after years of looking at, you know, the 6510 in my C64. And the other chips of note here are these two ROM chips. Not sure if this label was applied later, but it's copyright Apple 1983. This is apparently the Lisa boot ROM, the low and high, and it's revision H, which is the final revision of the Lisa OS boot. And one other interesting one here is this Vintage Micros Master Video ROM, which is apparently called the 6309. The Lisa service manual calls that the Video State Machine ROM. And here on the other side, we have the I.O. board. It actually has quite a few interesting chips on it. Up here is the 344-0041A, and that is the IWM chip, the Integrated WAS Machine Controller. So that's actually the disk controller, I believe. This one here is the Lisa XL800K. So again, I don't know if that was added later. So that's a 32K ROM for the disk controller that adds the 800K disk support. The original Lisa 2 just supported 400K 3.5 inch disk drive. So this adds support for 800K mechanisms. And this one here is a 6504. So this is a 6502 compatible chip. And it's actually very similar to the 6507 that's in the Atari 2600. The regular 6502 and the 6510 and the C64 are in a 40-pin package. This is just 28 pins. And so they got rid of a bunch of signals, including only making 8K instead of the full 64K addressable. So it's the same as in Atari 2600, except... This one does have one interrupt pin, while the Atari 2600's 6507 does not. So anyway, that's pretty cool seeing a 6502 in here. And presumably, that is for the disk controller. So that, that's all one unit there. And down here we have two 6522As, one for the parallel port and one to read the keyboard. Those are also chips made by, originally made by Moss, that go with the 6502 family for input-output, although these particular ones seem to be made by Cinertac. And here, another 8-bit chip, the Zilog Z8530, known as the SCC Serial Communication Controller. And finally, down here in the bottom right, we'll notice this empty space. Lisa's shipped with a battery pack here, which is notoriously leaky, and it will totally destroy the Lisa if left in. So, fortunately, Someone has removed that and saved this machine. If you want to see what happens if one's left in, check out the video that Dave at EEV Blog made. And that poor Lisa was toast. All right, we'll put the RAM back in here. And just making sure it's lined up properly down there. This memory board has a little bit of a curve to it, so it just has to be helped a little bit more down into the slot. There we go. There we go. And it just needs a little bit of gentle maneuvering to get it to line up perfectly there. Put that power supply back in. Tighten that back up and putting this back in there's just these four tabs along here that just have to line up with the appropriate holes here and we just tighten that up again okay we'll hook this back up let's see if it boots let's go hit the power button Come on. Oh yeah, there we go. And it does this quick testing. There we go. Wait, Lisa Office System Release 2.0. Copyright 1983, Apple Computer Inc.
And like I was saying, I can't do a direct video capture, so I'm recording the CRT at 60 frames per second, and it looks pretty good to me. So here we are. Note, the Lisa clock calendar is not set properly. Open the clock to set the correct date and time. Okay, and this is because that battery pack's not in there, and it doesn't have a substitute. We'll look at this right away. Okay. Oh, and we just had some stuff left open from last time it was used. So down here is the clock icon. You know, a lot of this is much like using a Mac. So we'll launch the clock just a moment. Software-wise, this is probably the strangest part of the Lisa is the clock. Not the app itself, but look at this. It's a 12 a.m. January 1st, 1980. Okay, so let's try and change it to 21. You see how the screen flashes? The year must be a number between 81 and 95. The last keystroke was discarded. <laughs> so can you imagine this? This isn't Y2K compliant because it can't even get to Y2K. Apparently internally it just uses a 4-bit counter for the year. That is 16 possibilities, and it's added to 1980. And for an unknown reason, 0, or 1980, is also invalid, at least by the clock app. So you're left with the possibilities of 1981 through 1995, and that's it. So if we cancel this... So we we'll try that, 1995... The thing I have to try here is put in December 31, 1995, and let's put 11, yeah, that's a bit tedious, 59, and PM, and now we'll wait a minute. This is the largest value that we can put into the clock, so what happens when one minute wraps around? I might fast forward here just so we're not waiting. There you go. New Year's Day 1996, and if you're still using your Lisa, it wrapped around to January 1st, 1980. And just to continue how, how quirky this is, if I just try to change it from January to, say, February, let's put a 2 in there, and I click out, see, it updated the year to 1981. Because 1980, it's a valid year as far as the internal clock, but the clock app won't allow it to be input. Very strange. Okay, that's enough about the clock. So you can close the window by double-clicking on its top left corner. And just on the regular desktop, you press and hold the single mouse button. And it gives you some options here. I don't know what happens if we go monitor the printer. There's currently no printing in progress. Edit, and it has just one level of undo, but it's better than none. It seems that's system-wide. Housekeeping. Straighten up icons. Now, you notice there's no option to shut down the computer here. It seems the only way to do it is to press the power button, but it is a smart switch. When you press it, it shuts down any apps that are running, and then shuts down the computer. You can look at the Preferences program here. Just a moment, please. So, Convenient Settings. You can set them to the default. You can change the screen contrast. That is very dark. And that is the brightest. I'll put it around there. Minutes until the screen dims. The dim level, the speaker volume. This is only capable of beeping. It doesn't have any other sound hardware, unfortunately. Repeating keys, rate, and the mouse double-click delay. Here in the startup section, you can either choose starting up from the internal disk or the diskette. And the memory test, either brief or thorough. And device connections, you can add devices to serial A or serial B. Well, maybe it's smart. I wonder if it actually knows when something is connected. 
And we'll go here to the internal hard disk. So this does have the concept of folders, which a lot of operating systems back then didn't have. Go into tools. And this is an oddity that, you see how the clock is grayed out here and you can't even click on it. You can just rename it. So it's almost like when you drag something to a different location, you can't access it in its original home position, but it still keeps it. So we already looked at that. There's also a calculator app. Just a moment, please. That's taking a while to start up. There we go. So we can clear five times five equals 25. Actually, let's keep that down the corner. This apparently has multitasking, unlike the Macintosh that followed it. Well, for quite a few years anyway. And if we go into the apps, another oddity about the Lisa is that here's the programs that came built in. Lisa Write, obviously a word processor, Lisa Terminal, Lisa Project, Lisa List, Lisa Graph, Lisa Draw, and Lisa Calc. That's like a spreadsheet. But if you try to start these programs, try to start the app directly, it does start, does go through this process. Just a moment, please. Again, this is all running off the internal compact flash drive. It would be even slower on an actual hard drive. This tool is used to create and edit documents. To use the tool, tear off a piece of LisaWrite stationery and open it. We've started the LisaWrite application, but it has no means to actually start a new document included. Now, if we go up here under File and Print, it has this grayed out, tear off stationery. So for whatever reason, they decide to make all the workflow document-based instead of application-based. It's kind of strange and confusing, but I guess it was a, you know, a philosophy, a way of approaching things. So even though we start up the app, we cannot make a new document here. Like if you click, you see, it just tells you that you have to tear off a piece of Lisa Wright stationery. Okay. So how do we do that? We close these up, close up the apps folder. And you notice that Apple was using the term apps even way back in 1983. So what you do is you open up a paper here, like this one is the Lisa Wright paper. So we click on that, or double click. The Lisa is creating a new document from Lisa Wright paper on internal hard disk. To terminate the operation, hold down the Apple key. Okay, and now we have a new untitled Lisa Wright document here that we can rename, whatever, paper. I noticed that return doesn't actually work here. How about enter? Nope. That's what the mouse, you're supposed to use the mouse. Okay, so I've renamed it as paper. Now we can open that. And now it's launched Lisa Wright with this document. And here, and so it's just regular word processor, hello. So it does have that undo and undo returns the text I just typed in. So it's just like a toggling undo. We can search for text. We can change the style of our text. So this is sort of like a WYSIWYG word processor. So if we go here to like one third inch modern, this is big, whoop, big text. So that was a pretty big deal at the time. And we can change the formatting and page layout. You can notice here that we have our word processor running. I'll close this. And our calculator is still here as well. So if we type in a number like 64 here, 
And there is a clipboard. If I type in 64 and then highlight it, edit, copy, and go over here and edit, paste. And you do have a clipboard that can go between different apps that are simultaneously open. It's well known that Xerox had developed all this, and Apple didn't really steal the ideas from Xerox. Instead, they paid Xerox something like a million dollars worth of Apple stock in exchange for getting a good look at the Xerox technology, which then they tried to duplicate as best they could. And up under the file menu, we can set aside everything, and that's like shutting down those apps, or at least putting them on hold for later. So it's a little bit like minimizing all your windows or closing all your apps on your taskbar. And finally, I think we'll look at all the apps, but here, this, is, this Lisa draw is kind of interesting. It always puts the new app up <laughs> to the left. That's kind of messy. Let's call that draw. And launch it. And so this is a, uh, I want to draw a square, click, and there it is. You can move it around, change the size of it. Draw a circle or oval. Draw a series of connected lines. All right. Selecting another item is kind of a pain there. Okay, there we go. Move it. And we can duplicate it. And we can cut it. And we can paste it. Actually, I was reminded, if I go here to Arrangement, Bring to Front, Send to Back, that's exactly the same as in the, the modern day preview app for the Mac, which I use to make all my thumbnails for the channel. Actually, I think has those exact same menu options. So that's kind of funny. And again, we'll set aside draw. And if we're all done, I'll press the smart power button like I was mentioning. The Lisa is putting everything away before turning off. I'll power down. CRT makes a bit of a scary noise when it kicks out or the internal speaker. Lisa is turning off. Oh, <laughs> that always gives me a bit of a scare when it turns off there. So that's a look at the Lisa. The original Lisa was $10,000 in 1983. Uh, by the time they made the Lisa 2 and then the Mac XL, which were really just reconfigured Lisa 2s. I think they're down to about $4,000. And as Mac XLs, they apparently actually started selling okay. I read that Steve Jobs was very involved with the Lisa, but then he was taken off the project and told to go do something else. So he went and took over the Mac project and basically turned it into a cheaper version of the Lisa, which depending on the feature, actually had some improvements over the Lisa. So let's look at the Lisa. If I can figure out how to program it, I might make another video about it. Let me know if you're interested in that. Otherwise, we'll get back to some 8-bit stuff. Thanks to my patrons who support the channel. Thank you for watching, and we'll talk to you next time.